Hey everyone, Anarch here. In the previous videos in this series, we spent some considerable time inspecting the historical record and laying out theoretical and empirical arguments as to why states are forces of anti-socialist self-sabotage. We sought two examples in which states were used where very different approaches were taken so that we could compare and contrast their outcomes. If the state could produce any other outcome than forced submission of the masses and sabotage of worker control, we should have seen China and the USSR differ in enacting those conditions. But they in fact underwent very similar trajectories, despite very different material circumstances and ideological approaches. Why? And given this fact, what drives someone in the modern era to continue supporting these projects which, by all means, have now devolved into capitalist property relations? These are the two questions we will inspect in this fourth and final part of The State is Counter-Revolutionary. As we get started, I just want to say a socialist existing before the failures of the 20th century could hardly be blamed for having believed that the state might function as a transitory mechanism. Despite the theoretical justifications and historical examples that the anarchists used to demonstrate their concerns, the matter of whether the state could be repurposed to serve the needs of the proletariat was still an open question needing experimentation to conclude. After all, the bourgeois revolutions all utilized a state in the process of overthrowing monarchy. Perhaps, they might have thought, the anarchists were just purists or cynics. However, we're no longer in that era. We now have within the body of our historical analysis a record of those attempts to use the state for the means of socialism. It's now a matter of fact that the state sabotaged the project of worker liberation in precisely the way that the anarchists predicted it would. The anarchists were neither purists nor cynics. They were the realists. Many variations of state socialism were tried, and all degraded into capitalism, state capitalism, fascism, or social democracy in the best cases and we saw only a repeated and thoroughgoing vindication of Bakunin's words that no dictatorship can have any other aim but that of self-perpetuation, and it can beget only slavery in the people tolerating it. Freedom can be created only by freedom. So, as we embark on this conversation, let's just establish what the common goals of all socialist revolutionaries are. First, is to enact complete control of the masses over their workplaces. And second, is to protect from reaction and sabotage during the transition. So, how do they justify their ideology in face of the fact that their praxis in action inevitably suffocated socialism in its cradle and then recreated the conditions of capitalism? As we've inspected in part one, it's not justified by any sort of theoretical coherence, and as we saw in part two and three, it's not because it has a winning track record for worker control. As we shall see, the primary issue which animates all of this rhetoric is that the statists have constructed a mythology in which they are the true utilitarians of the left. They believe they're making the necessary sacrifices that will bring about socialism, and they're unconcerned if they're viewed as villains as they bloody their hands, because one day they believe they will be recognized as heroes. Said otherwise, they believe that the ends justify the means, without any conception of how the ends are fundamentally intertwined with the means. Much of the foundation for this utilitarian mythology was created by Lenin himself, but it was spurred along afterwards by a procession of leftist apologists and hagiographers, many of which marshaled their vast knowledge and intelligence 
not toward the rediscovery of a liberatory path, but toward the accumulation of excuses for why ailing state capitalist projects around the globe were not producing worker control. Desiring to appropriate these political systems as examples of success, they arrogantly called them actually existing socialism, as to suggest that all other forms of socialist praxis were impractical, idealist, or fantastical. The most primary examples of actually existing socialism were then the USSR and Maoist China, which is part of what's motivated our coverage of those projects in parts two and three. But it has included many other projects, which we've left out here for brevity's sake. One of the key aspects that comes up over and over in defending authoritarian leftism is the claim that these projects are structured as a siege response to the existence of a global capitalist hegemony. However, contained in this claim is one that is unspoken, namely that socialism is too weak to defend itself. This is the claim, in fact, that is always fundamentally embodied in the usage of the quote-unquote socialist state. The workers are too improvident and unfocused to lead themselves against capitalism. The state is a necessary evil to manage the ignorant masses in the war against other hierarchies. Even if one takes the most charitable form of this argument, that it is not the weakness of socialism so much as the strength of capitalism, it still makes an equally counter-revolutionary claim. Command is more efficient than self-governance. Indeed, this is what motivates arguments around productivism, which claim that these projects have to proceed through a period of capitalism so that they can develop the productive capacities of their nations. Said otherwise, they believe capitalism is more effective than socialism at developing infrastructure and productive capacities. From this we can see, even the most charitable version of this argument is anti-socialist at its core. If worker control is so supposedly fragile to sabotage and so bad at developing its own infrastructure, under the state socialist praxis, when and how will this golden age supposedly come that all of the enemies to worker control are abolished, where productive capacities are sufficiently developed? Are we to imagine some naive circumstance where the whole planet will be one international state capitalist economy and the supreme global vanguard which has hoarded power away from the workers for decades or even centuries? while achieving global dominion, will benevolently decide to hand over its power to the people? Even accepting the charitable interpretation, how will these future vanguard rulers even know that the productive capacities of the economy have reached a condition sufficient to undergo transition? Ultimately, these questions remain unanswered because they're built on a fantasy. We are expected to blindly trust the future of human liberation to a narrow group of rulers and their future willingness to dissolve their own absolute power. Such a naive bargain is not a new one. It is, in fact, the story of how the masses have sacrificed their own autonomy and dignity in every era. In Mutual Aid, a Factor of Evolution, and the state, its historic role, Kropotkin recounts what remains to this day a very compelling case for how the earliest vestiges of lordship arose in the village communities of Europe. In this period, forms of society which had persisted for thousands of years through principles of mutual aid and folk law were set upon by warring tribes. This didn't lead to a Hobbesian war of all against all, however, the village communities much preferred peace. For this reason, they were easy to persuade that they should exchange some amount of their harvest and land for protection by military brotherhoods. At the same time, the peasants, for long centuries having been the storehouses of folk law, increasingly began to trust this memory and application to specialists. 
ensuing from these sacrifices, Kropotkin says, gradually the first concentration of powers, the first mutual assurance for domination by judge and military leader is made against the village community. A single man assumes these two functions. He surrounds himself with armed men to carry out the judicial decisions. He fortifies himself in his turret. He accumulates for his family the riches of the time, bread, cattle, iron, and slowly imposes his domination over the peasants in the vicinity. In this way, the foundations, although not the entire form, of the lordly order were laid. As the people sacrificed their power to a small group, they made a bargain with their own autonomy, even a superior one to the ones that state socialists expect of us, as they didn't originally cede dictatorial authority to these brotherhoods. But having accepted the seeds of rulership, it would not be until the 11th and 12th centuries that they would tear the roots of domination from the ground, much belatedly recognizing what bargain they had made so long ago. Where the village communities revolted and threw off the yoke of their lords, they created the walled free cities of the medieval era, the only places during this time that the aspects of communal living and distribution based on need, the most prolific creation of art, architecture, and scientific advancement flourished. And wherever village communities ceded to the lords, through failure to resist or through capitulation, the communal ways were destroyed and were superseded by the cultural dominance of petty kings and their ideology of power perpetuation for centuries to come. Like all rulers throughout history, modern states seek to convince us of that foundational lie, that the subjugation of the ruler is the only thing standing between us and a more brutish subjugation. No state can be configured such that it is truly a tool for liberation. Such a notion is only a mirage brought upon by transition from one set of masters to another, or in resistance to such a transition. States care only for control of the masses. In believing in their foundational lie, in acting out of fear of internal and external enemies, we accept a pervasive daily domination by the state itself. In short, we internalize that we deserve to be ruled. We accept a supreme protection racket. After all, there will always be some perceived enemies to progress, internally and externally. And if we are to believe the claim that socialism is inherently fragile, as we've been asked to do by the authoritarian leftists, it will be susceptible to that same sort of sabotage for all of future history. What will prevent someone from creating a capitalist counter-revolution if indeed centralization and hierarchy are such efficient means of siege? What will prevent them from laying siege to us once more in the future and unraveling our delicate web of social connections? Is a socialist society in this conception not one which will then be constantly on the edge of reverting into state dominance? In this way, the statist line is a potent form of counter-revolutionary nihilism, because it supposes that socialism is not effective at combating capitalism as a force in and of itself. To the authoritarian, socialism is a weak antithesis that must be bolstered by mimicking the power structures of the previous era, not even capable of undergoing synthesis with capitalism under a socialist economic and governmental program. And viewing our future in such a way, you can be certain of one thing. If the state is allowed to rule, it will forever insist that it must continue to rule such that it can protect our supposedly weak projects of worker control from an infinite procession of threats. Every semblance of resistance, every force of sabotage that remains, will be transfigured into an existential threat that only the state can protect us from. This isn't some new trick. 
This is the foundational lie of the state in action. Authoritarians, having argued so doggedly for the domination of a paternalistic state and having therefore turned themselves into ideological infants, then develop a hyper-reductive view of geopolitics, precisely the one, in fact, that a state would like for them to have. Socialism becomes pathologically confused with opposing capitalist nations, or more appropriately, opposing all states aligned with the United States. They attempt to simplify the struggles of the entire planet down into two camps, the bad guy imperialist states and the good guy anti-imperialist states. In doing so, worker emancipation is simplified into a single question. Do you support the imperialists or the anti-imperialists? Woe be to those who don't submit to their reductive understanding. The statists who advocate this position are completely incapable of even understanding what an anti-imperialist entity might even look like. They, in fact, simply support one imperialist block over the other in a battle of two power hoarders. Just as the feudal societies of old had more and less power in the monarch, more and less a presence of trade guilds and worker control, these geopolitical blocks of monarchs didn't then represent the transition from feudalism into capitalism. They represented only variations of the feudal project carried out with varying degrees of freedom. This black and white campist view of the world is then essentially no different than supporting France over Great Britain and feudal Europe. This is why it's highly questionable to call authoritarian projects anti-imperialist. If a state becomes powerful enough to defeat the previous empire through centralizing an extraordinary control away from the people, it will then have assembled all of the tools of empire and arrayed them underneath a centralized body. All states are mechanisms for power hoarding, and given sufficient size and strength, will inevitably bring forth the brunt of their accumulated dominance to degrade the power of any group of people which threatens that continued dominance. In this way, they force all projects within their influence to resubmit to state power. It's not a matter of moral fortitude and leadership. It's a matter of mechanical certainty and time. More than just being a body of imperialism itself, the state apparatus, desiring only dominance and accumulation, will only tolerate vassals, and its operators know quite instinctively that no body of people who have banished the institution of the state will bow to their will. Thus, the only experiments that the state leftist can tolerate are other centralized state projects with similar socialist aesthetics. The existence of bottom-up management, whether fragile or robust, gives way to the lie of the state's necessity. After all, if socialism can exist in this world and thus demonstrate itself as a possible mechanism to enact the downfall of capitalism, the single-minded accumulation of state power will be proven a dangerous waste of time. Having betrayed the cause and its ideological adherence to a counter-revolutionary praxis, and the long decades of propaganda which hung upon a loose thread will be left to unravel. Imperialism is then not just the end stage of capitalism. Imperialism is the end stage of all concentrations of power if allowed to successfully pursue their goals. Kotoko Shusui, a Japanese anarchist living at the turn of the 20th century, says in his work, Monster of the 20th Century, that imperialism is to be viewed like a plague and that patriotism is the microbe that causes the disease, while militarism is the means by which the microbe is transmitted. Such patriotic propaganda is an inevitable outcome of the state. The state, defining its necessity through the need to protect from internal and external enemies, insists on itself as the storehouse of a canonical national identity. It is the upholder of borders, 
It's a way station at which the authenticity of the national vision is validated. To perpetuate a shallow patriotism is therefore contained within its very foundations. Although a central vanguard may serve to free its people from a previous despot and will almost certainly present itself as the only protection from external forces of sabotage, over enough time allowed to expand, that vanguard will become a new despotic ruling class, just as the military brotherhoods were to the peasants of the village communities. Thus, the authoritarian praxis can be summarily dismissed as a force for true anti-imperialism, because it can never actually eliminate imperialism as a construct. It is instead an ideology of imperial protection at best, and imperial competition if left to its devices of accumulation. The true antithesis to imperialism is the destruction of the very structures which produce empires. And the only entity which can achieve such an affair is a stateless and direct control by the masses. Perhaps recognizing these facts, you'll sometimes hear authoritarian leftists backpedal from these arguments and make a very different sort of argument. They'll say that statist projects represent successful socialist transformations because economic conditions are superior to what preceded them appealing to increased quality of life as the only meaningful metric to be discussed. This can be seen in the oft-repeated quote by Michael Parenti, the revolution that feeds the children gets my support. And such an argument sounds good on its face until one really turns it over in their mind. While it makes a very fair point that any revolution which overturns the horrors imposed by some imperial aggressor and improves the quality of life of the people can be said to have been a successful revolution, and we should be very clear in saying that we don't want a reversion to previous norms in these state capitalist societies, that doesn't mean that these were successful socialist revolutions. In fact, they can be most substantively understood as successful bourgeois revolutions, much like those that brought Europe out of feudalism and into capitalism. Having veiled themselves in the imagery of socialism, these state capitalist projects have constructed a twisted justifying ethos for the perpetuation of capitalist property norms. As Marx said in Critique of the Gotha Program, the capitalist mode of production rests on the fact that the material conditions of production are in the hands of non-workers in the form of property and capital and land, while the masses are only owners of the personal condition of production, of labor power. If the elements of production are so distributed, then the present-day distribution of the means of consumption results automatically. If the material conditions of production are the cooperative property of the workers themselves, then there likewise results in a distribution of the means of consumption different from the present one. Vulgar socialism has taken over from the bourgeois economists the consideration and treatment of distribution as independent of the mode of production, and hence the presentation of socialism as turning principally on distribution. Sometimes, when recognizing this fact, this is when the statist will offer another argument. They'll say, okay, so the workers don't own the means of production, but socialism doesn't happen in a day. Socialism is best understood as the transition between capitalism and communism. Thus, what these projects are practicing is socialist. But while this also sounds reasonable, it's just another one of Lenin's conjurations, a meaningless tautology, even a piece of placating anti-socialist propaganda. Because such a description offers zero features to identify when an economic or social system is socialist. It implicitly encourages the replacement of progress in worker control with bare aesthetics and empty promises. If socialism is just the transition between capitalism and communism, 
after all, and doesn't come along with any attendant features to identify that a society factually fulfills the descriptor, all it requires is a government claiming it will one day become communist. It's a definition requiring a time machine to verify. It's an invitation for rule by charlatans. When a state believes that all it must do to be considered socialist is call itself socialist, it then has no obligation to actually change the conditions which represent capitalism. Quite the opposite of these projects representing transitions from capitalism to communism, as authoritarians will sometimes admit in their arguments about developing productive capacities, they actually represent programs to build out the infrastructure of capitalism, only controlled by the state instead of a market of private capitalists. Worse, in many cases, market control increasingly returns to private capitalists anyway. The only thing that meaningfully defines a political or economic system is a mechanical description of its institutions and an analysis of who holds power. Only within its actual material structure can it truly be understood. And don't think that this is the opinion of only anarchists. This was the understanding of all the most radical socialists before the capitulations of the 20th century. Even Engels, often considered to be more authoritarian than Marx, says in his work Anti-During, State ownership does not do away with the capitalistic nature of the productive forces. The more of them that the state takes over, the more does it actually become the national capitalist. The more citizens does it exploit. The workers remain wage workers, proletarians. The capitalist relation is not done away with. Marx concurred in Das Kapital, saying, The veil is not removed from the process of material production until it becomes the production by freely associated people and stands under their conscious and planned control. In the wake of all these empty arguments, there's left only an aesthetic husk of the socialist and communist project that so many once fought for. Anything done in the name of communism, anything using its auspices, appropriating its symbols, or mimicking its rhetoric, gets called socialist, so long as it promises that one day it will transition into an economic project of worker control. The modern authoritarian leftist, after they have sacrificed every semblance of worker liberation, is then little more than an asthete, because they have no examples of a promising future socialist economic paradigm to point to, they become more concerned with aesthetics and claims of ideological fealty than they are with actual material reorganization of society into the hands of the workers. Tragically, this then places authoritarian leftists who've committed themselves to defense of these state capitalist projects in opposition to existing worker-controlled economies when they arise. The authoritarians, having attached themselves to bourgeois revolutions, defame anyone who opposes the statist bloc. Even committed socialists are labeled reactionaries, counter-revolutionaries, anti-communists, and so on. And so when a project of worker control and confederation appears in struggle as it's born, the centralized state and its adherents will not only broadcast that project's failures far and wide, they will often even actively work to undermine it from abroad such as in the case of the CNT FAI in Civil War Spain, or the Free Territories of Ukraine, or Socialist Yugoslavia, or the Shinmin Commune in Korea. Sitting atop this mountain of contradictions, and a long, established record of anti-socialist measures in their state projects, the authoritarians allow not a single flaw in horizontal worker-controlled projects. 
nor is it expected that these worker-controlled societies, attempting as best they can to actually produce a material opposition to capitalism, will receive the barest material aid. To the authoritarian, it is counter-revolutionary compromise for me, self-destructive purity for thee. Utilitarians, they are most certainly not. They are, instead, asthetes, worshipping at the shrine of the state. In his book, Seeing Like a State, James C. Scott lays out a robust theory of how and why the disasters of the state take place. The main thesis of his book can be explained in the following way. First, and perhaps most important, is the idea of what Scott calls legibility. Scott says that in order for information to be processed by any given entity, either collective or individual, it must be legible to that entity. This is to say, the information must fit within the framework of that entity and must be compressed to the degree that it can actually be received and processed. The state, as an inherently centralized entity, is composed of a small group of people, yet it makes dictates which affect the entire populace it rules. And both because this body of people will have their own needs as individuals and as a collective body, as well as because of the literal limitations of individuals within the state body to process the vast complexity of the world around them, the state forces information to be legible to it. But this simplification can't conceivably represent the diversity and depth of information on the ground, and in many occasions, it doesn't want to. Instead, in making the complexity of the real world legible to it, the state will have a tendency to pick and choose the pieces of information which are most useful to it. This narrowing of the information through need for legibility is what Scott calls the synoptic view. That is to say, the legible information becomes a synopsis of the real world. And in choosing the content of that synopsis, and making decisions based on it, the state enforces its dominance cyclically, first in the act of choosing which information it gathers, and then as it acts back on to societies and ecosystems as it perpetuates its needs. The state, viewing order as adherence to state dictums, then comes to suffocate the robust diversity of the real world. This is one very important reason why there's no possible metaphysical transmutation of the state, no ideological retranslation of the intentions of its ruling body, which can ever ultimately achieve control by the masses. The structure of the state is fundamentally built contrary to the needs of the masses in achieving self-determination. In Rudolf Rocker's work, Nationalism and Culture, he presents a very similar thesis. His focus, however, is instead on how the synoptic view of the state also creates stagnation in the creative, cultural aspects of humanity. He summarizes this well early on in the work. Political power always strives for uniformity. In its stupid desire to order and control all social events according to a definite principle, it is always eager to reduce all human activity to a single pattern. Thereby, it comes into irreconcilable opposition with the creative forces of all higher culture which is ever on the lookout for new forms and new organizations, and consequently as definitely dependent on variety and universality in human undertakings, as is political power on fixed forms and patterns. Between the struggles for political and economic power of the privileged minorities in society and the cultural activities of the people, there always exists an inner conflict. 
They are efforts in opposite directions, which will never voluntarily unite and can only be given a deceptive appearance of harmony by external compulsion and spiritual oppression. The synoptic view is not an error to regard idly, a hiccup to be mitigated after power has been accumulated. It is an eternal fact about how societies are necessarily ordered as bottlenecks in popular control are implemented. The more thoroughly the centralized power structures intervene in the lives of the people, the more do they force them into rigid, recalcitrant schemas which compress the robust diversity of the real world, and thus bring about the misery of humans and the collapse of complex ecosystems. This aspect, the collapse of complex ecosystems, is covered by James C. Scott in Seeing Like a State, but it's covered perhaps even more thoroughly by the life's work of ecologist Murray Bookchin. In his work, Ecology and Revolutionary Thought, he gives a very good elaboration on this aspect. Man is undoing the work of organic evolution. By creating vast urban agglomerations of concrete, metal, and glass, by overriding and undermining the complex, subtly organized ecosystems that constitute local differences in the natural world, in short, by replacing a highly complex organic environment with a simplified inorganic one, man is disassembling the biotic pyramid that supported humanity for countless millennia. In the course of replacing the complex ecological relationships on which all advanced living things depend with more elementary relationships, man is steadily restoring the biosphere to a stage that will be able to support only simpler forms of life. If this great reversal of the evolutionary process continues, it is by no means fanciful to suppose that the preconditions for higher forms of life will be irreparably destroyed, and the earth will become incapable of supporting man himself. Centralization and hierarchy of power are not only strangling human creativity, they are not only pushing societies into modernized slavery, they're at the root of our failure to steward the environment. Or, as Bookchin says in that same piece, the imbalances man has produced in the natural world are caused by the imbalances he has produced in the social world. We cannot conceivably solve the problems at hand unless we are willing to oppose all schemas of simplification and centralization, all hierarchies of power and privilege. These plans for human development are not simply enemy to socialist revolution, they are enemy to the future conditions of life on Earth. Because, ultimately, this is the true realization that needs to be had if we're going to reclaim the revolutionary vigor that was once seen in the early 1900s. We did not win the last world revolution. We lost. Cuba, China, Venezuela, the DPRK, and their like don't represent socialist successes. Improvements over previous paradigms, perhaps, but they are ultimately the co-option of a liberation movement, gone to die in the counter-revolutionary state. We must envision a struggle fought anew, and we must envision that struggle contrary to the failures of the authoritarians. They were given their chance, and their praxis betrayed the millions whose blood was spilled to bring about worker control. Hopeful projects exist across the planet, some small and some large, but today the workers do not control the means of production in any place where those original statist revolutions arose. All of those projects are instead now locked in a cycle of revanchism and bourgeois paternalism. As Guy Debord said in his Society of the Spectacle, 
the bourgeoisie is the only revolutionary class that ever won. So be certain, the only path forward in the task of liberation is the joining together of all oppressed peoples to overthrow the power hoarders and to destroy all of the mechanisms with which they hoard that power. Whether those be the state and capital, or whether they be white supremacist ideology, colonialism, imperialism, transphobia, sexism, ableism, and all other variety of bigotry. The ideology which might fuse together these diverse struggles in respect of the structures as they truly stand is anarchism, libertarian socialism. No matter the name it's called by, no matter the people who practice it, liberation can only come through the hatred of hierarchies of power and privilege. The state is but one of many forms of human rulership, one that is so pervasive that it has fooled even many fellow socialists of its necessity. But in allowing themselves to be fooled by this myth, they have become the pawns of a machine, convinced of its great men and of their righteous place in the turning of its wheels. Having allowed themselves to become sycophants to this machine, they have placed themselves in ready opposition to the goals of those who seek liberation. Even more, they have come to believe that their great men and their parties are what drive revolutionary change. They turn dictators and leaders into religious figures. They dismiss the needs of the masses as short-sighted. They appeal to the wisdom of their failed vanguards. These statists seeking to cope with the anti-socialist outcomes of their attempts have forgotten that it is the people who drive transformation and that all suppression of the people's immediate liberation is unacceptable to a revolutionary. Only where the people reign have we surpassed the age of capitalism. The revolution of the masses does not wait for permission. It is not an activity of states and power orders. Socialist revolution is an act of mass emancipation, and thus it can only be an act of the masses. Those who have forgotten this are now the conservatives of the left counter-revolutionaries laying in wait, hoping to co-opt liberation movements so that they might lead them down the dead end of state power once again. As we come to a close, I'd like to end on a quote by Leo Tolstoy, a passage from his book, War and Peace. In quiet and untroubled times, it seems to every administrator that it is only by his efforts that the whole population under his rule is kept going. And in this consciousness of being indispensable, every administrator finds the chief reward of his labor and efforts. While the sea of history remains calm, the rule administrator in his frail bark, holding it with a boat hook to the ship of the people and himself moving, naturally imagines that his efforts move the ship he is holding on to. But as soon as a storm arises and the sea begins to heave and the ship to move, such a delusion is no longer possible. The ship moves independently with its own enormous motion. The boat hook no longer reaches the moving vessel and suddenly the administrator, instead of appearing a ruler, and a source of power becomes an insignificant, useless, feeble man. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you want to help spread the work I'm doing here, click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment below. Also, if you want to help me eat and pay the bills, become a patron at the Patreon link below. Anyway, I'll see you next time. Which side are you on, boys?
is which side are you on? Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? They say in Harlan County there are no neutrals there. You'll either be a union man or a thug for J.H. Blair. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? Tell me, which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? My daddy was a miner, and I'm a miner's son. He'll be with you, fellow workers, until this battle's won. Tell me.